We spent the past couple of years in a crazy hot market. Louisville home sales decline as demand outpaces supply. Effective communication is at the core of any situation. If you master these two ideas, you'll have a chance of being successful at residential real estate marketing. I think you need to be looking for investment opportunities that move the needle. The market will never crash if demand exceeds supply. This is what I've been telling you all along. This is the Jay Pitt Show. And we're back, folks. Welcome back to the Jay Pitts Show. I'm your host, Jay Pitts, here with Ryan Harris. And, I mean, dude, we have to hear the need a pad. Oh, need yeah. a new pad. Have you this seen sh- these? Dude, I've seen them. I mean, so, I've, I've, I don't know that I've seen that exact shirt, but etownapartments.com. Yes. And my, uh, need a new pad, hop on over. That has been, I, I've been aware of this. Yeah, slogan. so my dad owns a lot of apartments in Hardin County, Ca- E-Town mostly, yeah. but... Hardin County and single family homes that he sure. rents out. Uh, pretty much has built all his apartments. But uh, first off, etonapartments.com, he snagged that pretty early on. Yeah, that I was mean, solid. You, solid. You solid pretty much don't have to do anything else for SEO. Yeah, like, no, no, no. Uh, Somebody Googles Eton Apartments. Boom. Eton Apartments websites. Pop yeah, absolutely. Uh, we also now have Eton Self Storage, Elizabethtown Storage dot com too so okay getting some good websites but need a new pad hop on over that's just been a slogan for a long time he kind of retired it yeah uh, but for brought it back 10 15 years it was uh his slogan and was that uh, an old shirt or is that no i mean he still uses it sometimes it's just not all over the website and he used to have a huge trailer with this big frog on it (laughs) and funny enough so he used to have a frog suit like and he would wear no. Who do you think he wore that? I don't think so. I would love he, to see a If made, you were going to say yes, I wanted to see a photo. He made us swear and stand outside the <laughs> office at, at the you road. Did? Yeah, a few times. I need a or it was just too. like other high school All kids right. wearing it. Make a note. Text, I don't think there's ever a picture of me. Text Teresa and, Harris asking for frog photos. I bet we still right. have the frog suit, though. Oh, man. Yeah. So just dance out there in okay. front of uh, the office. And <laughs> it's so funny because, you know, Oh gosh, from twenty eight. That's so. like the that's like the uh the twelve, thirteen years ago when I was probably doing this, still in high school. Uh, you know, E Town was very small still. Oh, or yeah. relatively. And and it still and, kinda is, but it's growing. Grown a ton and probably will grow a ton yeah, more in yeah. the next ten years. But uh where his office is, there's that stoplight right there. Yeah, yeah. And uh you would always see people you know. And their car is just taking videos, laughing at you. But they don't. Nobody knew it was me in there. So like, <laughs> so I they didn't have like a. Face I knew them. Out. No, no, no. But you could see. I mean, it's it's a mascot outfit. That's like, funny. Yeah, I was picturing a cutout for your face where we could see you. No, no, no. And that uh, that's awesome. Like to just think about. It. It's like you're you're like the Little Caesars pizza sign flipper. Like, yeah. They literally. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but like. Somebody sent me one There's time. There's a national championship for like sign flipping. Is there really? I didn't even know it was a thing until somebody sent me like a monster.com listing for sign flipper and they literally interview and hire sign flippers. Yeah. Which anyway, all good. So um, good start to the show today. Hop on over yeah, to hop. etownapartments.com. Yeah. No, no, uh, no, no sponsorship necessary. <laughs> we just give. No free sponsors, but. <laughs> no, but. Um, so yeah. All right, so cool. Uh, what do we got in store for us today? Yeah, let's just uh, let's go ahead and hop into how we always start the show, consumer real estate question. Uh, this person asked, Jay, in your experience, who has a better chance at being a successful successful realtor? The kid who gets his license right out of high school or college, or is it the 40-year-old who worked a corporate job for 18 years? Who has a greater chance? That's really hard to say. I've seen both be quite successful. I've seen both fail. Um... I'm going to say, I'm going to say the young person, the right out of school person. Here's why. Um, you, you probably or you could possibly have a ton of relatable skills as the 40-year-old who's been through corporate America. You could have relationships. You could have, um, you know, some hopefully some startup capital to do some advertising. All that is, all that is great. But... You have obligations, you have a mortgage, you have car payments, you have kids' school tuition maybe, you have health insurance, you have lots of lots of expenses. I mean, probably 10x the expenses of a kid right out of high school. Um, that 
raises the stakes. And certainly for the right person, it could motivate them to be astronomically successful. But um, I would venture to say, based on just simply looking at the failure rate across the industry as a whole, that that pressure probably leads to more failure than it does success. Yeah. The less pressure applied because right out of high school, you're probably not married. You're probably don't have kids. You don't have school debt. You'd probably drive in an old car, right? Maybe there is some debt attached. Maybe there isn't. There's not, you know, bad mistakes typically from, you know, mismanaged finances over the course of a, you know, 10 to 15 years of adulthood, the stakes are lower because, and that for that reason, you don't have to sell as much as fast and you can slowly grow your career. Mm-hmm. Um, all this, you know, again, takes nothing into account about the individual, right? And the individual's skills and superlatives will transcend everything else. It doesn't matter the pressure applied externally, but I would just say the young person because of less pressure applied. Nice. Uh, how many agents would you say you've interviewed over the last seven years? How long have you had the team now? Uh, so the team was started. The team was started. If you want, I started selling in 2008. The first agent joined in January of '09. Okay. So I had an assistant and one agent in January of 09. So I, I hired an assistant in 14 years. I hired an, I hired an assistant years. nine months in. Okay. Nine months nice. in to my career, I hired an assistant. She was part time, was a college student, and I didn't pay very much because I didn't have very much. But I needed the help. And so does the team start nine months in? Does the team start 13 months in? I don't know how you would look at that. No later than 13 months. So that would have been 2009, so that's 15 years up for the team. The brokerage, I started in 2015, so we're coming up on nine years for the brokerage. Okay. Um, How many agents have I I interviewed? (laughs) Um, 300, probably. How fast can you tell if you like somebody as a fit for the team? Pretty quickly. Yeah. Pretty quickly. No, this is a great discussion, Ryan. And I will tell you this. Um, we tend to be pretty um, – we tend to be pretty, pretty. Um, I would say – I don't know if liberal is the right word, but li- we're pretty liberal in the opportunity we provide. Uh, I In an interview, and, and maybe this is, this is a, a marker for somebody who wants to be an agent and wants to come work with us, you need to show me something, just something, that gives me – the belief that you can be successful in the relatively short period of time that we have to interview someone to, um, to learn about them. I can't possibly know enough about that person to know with certainty whether they're going to be successful. Now, some people jump off the page in a bad way and in a good way. Um, the majority of the people, we have a relatively small initial investment, at least, and this is, this is, it's, it's less consequential now. The money is the same as it's always been, but when you have five agents on your team and you give your time, energy, and effort to a new agent joining, when you have five agents on the team, that's harder than when you have 35 agents on the team. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like I can take a risk on somebody now um so you just kind of have to completely just like step in it i was laughing while you were talking because it you said uh some people jump off the page in a good way or a bad way and i'll i guess i can say this i don't know maybe we'll maybe we'll have to cut this but (laughs) i'll never forget and this was prob i would say maybe like don't name names no i don't even know the person okay only was in a room with them one time was it was like guy? six or seven months ago. No. Okay. Uh, but we were sitting in a Friday round table. And oh, this like, Lord. just started, kept talking like every two minutes. And everybody in the room was like, what is going on? And yeah. uh, I think. Uh, I never saw that person again. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were going to say, <laughs> around the time you started, we had someone on the team that, I, I guess I can say this. It was a young guy. Who I've had, heard this story. Who had a humongous <laughs> ego. Actually, probably not. He was probably tremendously insecure. Yes. And he spoke as if he had a humongous ego 
as overcompensation and offended a lot of people in the office in a very short period of time. And we just let him go. Yeah. We just said, Hey, this is not working. We got to move on, but that's just it. Right. Um, so great leaders supposedly, you know, make decisions, uh, quickly and change them slowly. That does not apply, unfortunately, to letting real estate agents go. Yeah. You can't let a bad one go fast enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's just because culture is, as cliche as it's become, is the most important thing in an office. Absolutely. And, you know, it's something I think we are second to none at here. And so if you allow someone to poison the culture for whatever reason, right, unwillingness to work, um, like a negative energy, you know, uh, you know, somebody that does immoral, illegal, or unethical things. Um, y- you can't, you can't allow the good people, the well-meaning people, the the successful, the those that bring your culture up and and make it special. You can't allow them to be hindered by someone who's toxic. Yeah. So you got to let that person go and let them go quickly. Yeah. And especially today's day and age when yeah. everybody's making it seem like the office isn't important. Well, when you have an office that people come to, let's make it that much better and prove everybody wrong. Well, if you can get people to come to your office these days, you're doing something special. Yeah. I actually had a question on here for last show that I didn't ask that was around like why some of the real estate agents who are the most difficult to work with don't have a physical office. <laughs> Uh, which we don't have to dive into. I think you know the answer to that uh, question, right? Well, I, I do. Um, I think it's pretty simple. They don't. I think one of the most important things about being a real estate agent is uh, having other agents to talk about their deals with mm-hmm. and solve problems, and you, you learn from other agents' problems because no matter how long you've been in the business, yeah. you have not seen everything. Nope. Uh, and things are always changing. Always so. a fresh spin. There's always a fresh spin on – the same problem. Yeah. Right. You, it, it, well, what seems to be the same problem. There's a fresh take, a fresh spin, a new wrinkle that you have to, that you have to solve for. Mm-hmm. So you're right. Like being exposed. And we just had a gentleman, uh, probably 35 year veteran of the real estate industry just joined our office recently had been with a very famous, famously, uh, virtual brokerage, right? No brick and mortar office, uh, nowhere to go, no one to see. Took two hmm. to three days. Took two to three days to get their broker on the phone when they needed to have a conversation. Just tough. And you know what he said was, it's like really refreshing to see someone have a vibrant office culture. Well, and in, in an industry that does beat you down, it does. Uh, it sometimes helps to be around other people beaten down by deals. For sure. No, <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. Totally, uh, totally if you're suffering, you might as well suffer with others. Not that we're <laughs> suffering. but Don't uh, suffer in silence. Yeah. Misery loves company, right? Yeah. Um, real quick, uh, another thing about interviews you've done. Is there anybody you've interviewed that you thought – like, is there anybody that sticks out? You thought they were going to be amazing and they were yes. terrible, and then somebody you thought was going to be terrible and they were amazing? Yes. Absolutely. Do you, There's multiple examples. So I guess the person you thought would be terrible but turned out great, do you think you could say their name? No. Okay. I don't want to do that. Um, I don't want to do that, but I will tell you – I'll, I'll give you an avatar, okay? It's someone who is not the prototypical personality that you would expect to be in sales um, or real estate even for that matter it's there's there's some maybe some brashness um some awkwardness right it, it's someone who seldom says the right thing right mm-hmm. like you we all can probably visualize somebody that we know that's really good with words they're a, a quintessential salesperson right they always have the right answer or the right words for every objection um but this this individual didn't uh, it rarely does and has had some success uh, and and again was a little brash and not really a people person and so like the individual would get things done I mean I'm not gonna say this is like a Hall of Fame type but it's it's somebody who's making a good living in real estate and in spite of not having those skills that we would all expect to be a requisite and really I think that what they do is they they, they handle rejection really well um, probably that brashness has led them to experience a, quite a bit of rejection. And so they're used to it and they don't quit. 
they just keep going and going and going. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's not maybe, you know, like any unrealistic amount of effort, but they just have a high resistance to setback. So they get a setback and it just, it, it washes right off of them and they take the next step forward. And that's yeah. what, that's what it is. Awesome. Now, now the individual that was, I expected to be really successful that wasn't, and there's been numerous of these, this avatar, um, very successful in another industry, high opinion of themselves and their level of achievement. Um, seeing certain levels of activity as beneath them because of their stature yeah. and kind of expecting to start in the middle instead of at the bottom, if that makes sense. Like they know they're not starting at the top, but they think they're starting in the middle because they've made a six figure salary in another industry for a decade. And, um, just, I, I'm not going to do that or, or I will do that. And then they just don't. Mm-hmm. Some say I won't do that. Some most say, yeah, I'll do that. And then won't. <laughs> right. So it's, it's just, you're starting a new career. You, you don't get to start on second base, right? You have to, you have to touch all the bases and this, that's, uh, unfortunately the case. The people that come in with the expectation because they know a lot of people that immediately those people will send them real estate business. Guess what? All those people you know already know a real estate agent. They already know a real estate agent. And guess what? They already identify you as something other than a real estate agent. You you have to retrain them. Like you don't start at zero, you start below zero. Yeah. You really in terms of awareness. I think it's humility is the there's there needs to to be much more humility. Like it's great to think highly of yourself, but you have to have humility too. And well, the the it goes back to the individual that you asked, the two avatars you asked about earlier, the the kid right out of high school, or the forty year old who's been successful at something else and transitions. Um, out of those two, who, the kid who has the kid has, the has humility. all the humility. The kid has all the humility. They ex, they don't expect to succeed. They're fearful. Yeah. Right, which is funny because they don't have anything to lose. Yeah. So why why the fear? Um, the the forty year old probably has a lot to lose, and yet I've seen more instances where that individual is above certain things and don't show the humility they need. So it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. Um, I will say I've seen a forty year old in the industry transition into real estate and be the top, if not if not the top one of the top two or three team leads in this, in this market. Yeah. And they transitioned from, that's a, always fun to see too, from a corporate job. It's like, okay, so-and-so knows a ton of people and they've made some good money and they, let's see how they, how they transition and invest. And yeah, like, well, Bob Sikoler is a good example. Bob Sikoler was in media and he was a number one real estate agent in this market for some time. Um, you know who I think is another great example Go on ahead. your teams to Kyle Pinkle. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. he came from a perfect role where people trust him. Tons of humility though. Yes, absolutely. And crushes it. Yeah. Tons uh, of humility that comes with that guy. Jimmy Welch is another one. Jimmy Welch is a team lead at KW and came from another industry and immediately had success. Yeah. You know, um, Jimmy had the courage to spend a lot of money from day one though, with no promise of income. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is a, I mean, when you're 40 and you've got family and kids and all the obligations and mortgages and debt and like being able to write checks without income is it takes guts. Yeah. So, you know, more power to those guys. Absolutely. Um, All right. Let's uh, move on to another real estate topic. So you've heard of shrinkflation. Uh Uh, I'm sure everybody has where brands are quietly reducing the amount of, let's just do groceries for example yeah. i mean that's where everybody really hears about well, it. biden's example of the potato chips yeah you know and the stiff from the state of the union uh-huh right so, i don't know if you heard that but that was a large uh, topic i saw a little clip on large it, topic so. of, uh, of that was addressed in the in the state of the union yeah so uh you know shrinkflation now they're bringing it to the real estate world so uh housing affordability this is a, an article from resi club which by the way Great company that's yeah. growing rapidly. And I really enjoy, forget their CEO's name, but he puts out a lot of great uh, okay. information on Twitter. I'll, I'll have it for next time. But uh, title of this article is, Housing Affordability is So Strained That Some Home Builders Are Turning to Smaller Builds. 
goes on. So on last month's earnings call, DR Horton CFO Bill Wheat told analysts that to adjust to changing market conditions during fiscal 2023 and into fiscal 2024, we have increased our use of incentives and reduced home prices and sizes of our home offerings where necessary to provide better affordability to home buyers. Uh, in 2023, DR Horton reduced its average square foot by 3%. Heading for the nation's largest publicly traded home builder told our investors that they expect continued gradual moves down from a mixed shift perspective in terms of average square footage. The 3% drop is the uh, steepest drop in history wow. of new construction square footage. Okay. I, I mean, I believe it. Well, but that's just it. I mean, it, it, with when rates increased substantially in you know the summer of 22, late summer of 22, um, the need for a redirect w was present. And I think we've all seen it. Um, you know, there are, there are price thresholds that buyers don't want to pass. Um, I, I would be interested in seeing the price per foot. Yep. Um, because I, I don't know that that has had a drastic impact. I think in order to be shrinkflation, you're charging more for less. And it's easy to say that is true because prices are inclining and homes are getting smaller, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. It, it's price per square foot, really. So are you, are you paying higher price per square foot and getting smaller homes. That's, I think, I would say, probably. otherwise it's just inflation yeah. <laughs> that we're talking about, not shrinkflation. I would say probably, uh, now there's this awesome chart in this article. So in 2023, the median square footage of existing single family home sales was 1600 square feet for new construction. That number was just over 2000, 2036 square feet. And that's the closest it's been since 2013. And in this chart, it shows existing homes, median square footage versus new construction, median square footage. And they're inching closer and closer and closer and closer. So 2013, the existing homes, median square footage was 1,593. New construction, median square footage was just over 2,300. So okay. we've gone from 2,300 for new construction, median square feet, all the way down to almost 2,000. Well, that, square that makes footage. sense to me. And then, uh, so, and then the... Existing homes, median square footage is going up a little bit. So that makes perfect sense to me, though, because, you know, Ryan, what you're saying, what, what you're illustrating and what that graph is illustrating. Uh, and I really think the truth that we're seeing in the marketplace is that new construction is changing from a luxury to a necessity. Right. We all know that the price per square foot is higher to build new. And what do we say? OK, we say, well, building gets you exactly what you want, but you're going to pay for it. Because mm -hmm. the price per square foot of an existing home is always lower than the price per square foot of a new home. But as inventory of new of, of existing homes is not there and it does not meet demand of how many people want to move, then new construction has had to take a larger share of the total marketplace and will continue to because inventory contends, continues to drop further and further to historic lows even after it's been at historic lows. So like that's what's happening, right? And builders are having to respond because you're not dealing with luxury buyers, buyers that are afforded luxuries. You're dealing with buyers that have necessities and their necessities is that they have enough bedrooms for their children to have a spot, right? And enough bathrooms. And, you know, I think you're probably seeing that across the board. Um, I will say that custom homes remain a luxury, and there still is a lot of money in the economy for luxury luxury homes. Yeah, those people are not borrowing money in a lot of cases. So, um, and less and less builders, from what I see nowadays, too, are are wanting to do custom homes. This is true. Such a pain. This is true, but but it, it's the same. It's the same thing. It is a pain, um, and there are people that make a that make a career out of that because like, there is less competition. Yep. You know, the Jason Blacks, like the artisan signature homes, like building a house on the side of a mountain over, you know, off Brownsboro Road, you know, for the founder of Fireball, right? And it's just like you drive by it and you're like, man, that's sick. Yeah. Like no chance that guy's got a mortgage. 
No, not in this environment. You know, it is. So anyway, ungodly that's, huge, dude. That's a great house. Great it is house, huge, and yeah. it's kind of cool. Everybody, great can drive follow. By and artisan, see it. artisan <laughs> signature homes. Jason Black's. He's a great Instagram follow too. Okay, post some awesome stuff. They do some awesome stuff. Yeah, no free ads. Yeah, no free ads. <laughs> uh, breaking news. So, oh. uh, Fanduel. There was a. It was a. It was, the max bet you, you could do was ten dollars, but it was to bet a hole in one on the players oh, yeah? on 17 this this week so it was like 10 bucks to win like 37 dollars oh, nice. the mo- most you could bet was 10 dollars already been a hole in one it's thursday wow so, yeah i thought you were going to tell me that we have a basketball coach no i mean we can get into that if you want i mean we might as well yeah i have some more real estate stuff one more topic let's do real estate and then we'll go to then we'll okay go to Kenny uh so this is pre-pandemic home affordability so this is from lance lambert and it was a tweet, so I'll, I'll just read it and jump in when you want to. So Lance Lambert on Twitter said, if U.S. income spiked 69%, we'd return to pre-pandemic housing affordability levels. If U.S. home prices fell 41%, we'd return to pre-pandemic affordability. If mortgage rates fell 4.3 percentage points, we'd return to pre-pandemic affordability. To be clear, the ifs don't mean that I think these are possible paths. Instead, it's how far the given metric would have to shift in order to return to housing affordability to historic norms. As of today, we aren't on a path to pre-pandemic housing affordability. Fair. Which ones do you think is most likely if one of those three things were to happen? um, So, and just to remind you, it was if U.S. income spiked 69%, if U.S. home prices fell 41%, or if mortgage rates fell 4.3 percentage points? Um, I'd say home prices is most likely, but... I'd say rates. Rates will never fall 4.3 I don't think so either, but I can't I mean, see home prices falling 41%. I don't, I don't think any of them are possible. I think, I think I've think i witnessed home prices take a dive um, in my career. Uh I think there is zero chance rates go back in the threes. I don't know if we're going to get a drop this year now. Uh, I think we will. I think it's going to be later. Yeah. Um, I, you know, a whole conversation for, for another show is how it's possible that we were led to believe that there would be six rate cuts this year. Like what uh, media malpractice. Well, you know, like, as long as these uh, meme coins that people have started creating, I don't know if you've been seeing any of it on Twitter, but it's like uh, dog with hat and like, Joe Bowden and like uh, there's a one that's off Trump and people are putting a thousand dollars into them and making 500,000 in like 48 hours. I mean, now I don't know if they're liquid. Well, Scott, you know, a good friend of ours here, Scott did that with Doge. Yeah. But Doge, you know, even though it is a meme coin and there's no utility for it more, there's no limited supply. Like, I guess it's the most established meme coin. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because, and I think well, because there, Elon. I think there is liquidity behind. I think you actually can pull your money out. I'm not sure you because can Elon has others. Elon has an affinity for it. I'm trying to find an Elon tweet or a retweet. Um, I'm gonna have to find it here in a minute, but it, it, we would. Yeah, it's you can keep else. looking. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. These scam coins, it's it's a retweet. He, he, he tweeted a uh, another account. And so I, I won't substantiate these, but they look right on the face, these numbers. These scam coins are getting crazy. Someone just shilled me the following. 27 trillion in circulation, unlimited supply yeah. cap, w- one node, 25% of supply minted in the last six months, one percent of holders own thirty percent. Just kidding. That's the dollar. Yeah, I saw that. Too. Like, that like great. this. Like, you know, sometimes these like comments, the way they're structured, slap you in the face with truth. That's what happened to me when I was reading that. Yeah, I was like, oh lord. You know. So anyway, all right, we can we can move on from yeah. Doge yeah. and meme coins and all that. But I, well I, here's the thing: I'd, Bitcoin all time high again. I would like to. See, you know what I would like to do um, with the three that exercise. It would take some math, so we can't do it on the spot. Let's hypothesize. Go back to those numbers. 69% income increase? Uh, let me pull it back up again. I think I went away from it. So, um, yes, yeah, 69% increase. 41% drop in home prices. Yep, and then I think mortgage rates need to fall by like 
Okay, so I'm I'm curious. I'm curious. And I don't know if this somebody could check my math on this. If you could have if you could take 33% of each, would that do it? Mm. So 23% decrease in home prices, a 16% a little less, a little less, 14%. Right. 14, 28, like 14. 13 and a half. 13, f- so say 14% decrease in home prices and a, what was the third one? 4.3%. So 1.4. Yeah. 1.4% decrease in rates. Yeah. Now, is Mike, that possible? I wish you respond to that tweet with that. Is it possible? Uh, is it possible that those things happen? And which one is least likely? Because I would the say income. Would, rates are most likely. 20% decrease in incomes impossible 20 plus percent decrease in income or, or increase, increase it, it's it, impossible in one year there's yeah. no way no. um and I, I don't see home pre- home prices dropping like that either so but i'm just curious if yeah. that would take us back if a third of each occurred right you know so you pick and choose a third a third a third right making the, trying to make the whole would that return to pre-pandemic affordability i don't know it's a question maybe uh that's Great thinking, though. It's kind of what I wish our government would do. It rounds the edges. <laughs> it rounds the edges is, is yeah. what it does. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess let's get into Kenny Payne. So if you're not from Louisville, maybe follow college basketball, but I uh, assume most of our listeners are from Louisville yeah, or Kentucky. For sure. Uh, Kenny Payne out finally. Kind I put out a tweet the other day that I was going to pop my – Tenure Pappy. bottle of Pappy when it was official. I'm going to do that this Friday. As I say, you did not. Uh, I did not. Uh, I was like, oh, I want to do it Friday. I'd like to enjoy it with maybe a couple of buddies too. Okay, I got you. Um, well, so. I, I I poured a poured a little uh, St. Cloud on the rocks last night, nice. and that's why I was asking. Yeah. Because I was like, you know what? I'm sitting here. I, I was I angry. Was, I was tired after golf. I told you <laughs> I, we weren't going to talk about this, but I had a bad day at the course yesterday. I was very frustrated when I left, and we've talked about it on on the show. I don't typically get frustrated. I've maintained a pretty level head. Yesterday was a bottom for me. I called, and I've already got lessons set up I'm, after yesterday. It's the best thing that ever happened I'm, to you. I'm tired of getting round. better without getting better is what yeah. I told him, uh, which I think is a very good way to put it. That um, is a good way to put it. So – so anyway, uh, I wanted a bourbon on the rocks last night. I avoided all social media golf uh, in the hours in between the course and getting my kids to bed. And then I was like, can I watch um, Full Swing? Full Swing. And I did. I poured a, poured a bourbon and watched a couple episodes of Full Swing. So I'm back. I'm, I'm, I'm off being angry. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, anyway. So, so you know, I have a few things on Kenny Payne. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so my tweet was, you know, I'm going to open this bottle once the worst coach in college basketball history and the worst coach in maybe all of sports <laughs> of all time is officially fired. And I, I believe that. He's the worst college basketball coach ever. Uh, He's, he was bad. Awful. He Never bad. took accountability. Ever. He made $1 million per win. Oh, uh, actually, that's... a little over. That's so and bad. I don't want him near another little facility again, unless we get to boo him because he's an assistant for UK again. Uh, <laughs> we'll love that. So that's best case scenario, actually. I I, uh, I, I would love him I back think, there. I don't think he'll get hired back in Lexington. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't think I don't think UK fans would say. So I'm I'm interested. Um, this is a little off topic. I know I said we talk about Kenny Payne, but I, I'm pretty sure we were on the same. Uh, group text where uh, Matt Jones tweets were shared. Yeah. Did you see this? Yes. Okay. So Matt Jones. I sent them. You, did you send them to yeah. us? Okay. So Matt Jones said what he said about Kenny. Um, what struck me as as a UK fan, it was the most balanced assessment I've ever seen him make of Louisville. And in that, he called us the seventh best program in the United States. Okay. So my question to you is, what are the six before? If Number one, do you agree? I think I yeah, do. Yeah. I think I do. I think I agree with the number. I expected him to say 14th or something that would be absurd. But if we are the seventh best program, who are the six in front? I think the top four are no doubters. Where I, where I think the debate gets interesting is number five and six. So, so 
Can you rattle off real quick? Yeah. Um, number one. Number one is probably UK. Probably UK. I would say maybe Duke, but probably UK. So Number two. I have a great chart here I saw on Twitter. I, do you want me to just say this chart and we'll, we'll debate it? So we it's can. All, it's all-time blue bloods and then current blue bo- bloods is what it is. Okay, so that conversation could go there. But let's – okay. I, I think regardless that the top four are the same. UK, Duke, UNC, UCLA. I'm going to go Kansas. Kansas. I'm going to go Kansas. Kansas has had more success recently than UCLA. Now, there is an argument for one other, um, and I would put them still at five, though. Who is who, Who's number five for you? Uh, and it's would it, you, would you it's say, not UCLA. Would you say UConn? It would be UConn. Yeah, UConn has five titles since '99. Yeah, right. I mean, they they are the blue blood right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, and then so six, I would go UCLA because they're all time titles leader, even though they haven't been successful in a long time. Yeah. So right. here's what this says. It Who's says, the current? I'm it curious. Says the the all time blue bloods are UNC, IU, yep. UK. Kansas, UCLA, Duke, current blue bloods, which I don't really agree with some of them, but Gonzaga, Marquette, Villanova, UConn, Arizona. See, I disagree with Marquette. I disagree with Arizona. Who else? Gonzaga. Gonzaga hasn't really won enough. No. Um, I, I can't put them ahead of Baylor. Right? Yeah. Like you can't give them you can't give them more credit for for not they're not supposed to be successful. But so like a final four appearance, like once every five years for them over the past 20 years and one title, don't they have, they haven't they won one title? Like I, it's not enough for me. Um, I, I want to know where is like, where is like, where is like Virginia? Where is, where is, um, you know, Pitt? Where is, you know, some some teams that have been really good at times mm-hmm. that have good programs and good coaches. Um, where's Texas? Like, you know, there's, there's some other really good programs out there currently that are not historical blue bloods. Like I think U of L U of L could make without the dumpster fire that we've been the past two years, I could make a very similar argument to IU to be in the, historical blue bloods category yeah, i'd say Louisville's a better job than iu i think it is absolutely a better job uh, than IU. definitely syracuse yeah. where's syracuse at don't know they're they're <laughs> around right yeah so anyway, but that's interesting marquette come on it's Good all about it. national championships you know and it final is. fours really really that's the i don't only even think things. elite eights matter too much i don't think they matter at all uh, so. i think missed tournaments matter matter in the opposite direction mm-hmm. Right, missed missed NCAA tournaments matter. Um, anyway, that's that's cool. So okay, so back to Kenny. The really the thing that irks me the most is the lack of accountability. Like, I hate the losing. Trust me, I hate the losing. But when you lose with class, you're still getting fired. But I'm not angry. I'm angry. Right, that. You say, sit there after your final game and say, I told you so. Yeah. What a quote to use the Titanic. Oh, my God. You think people should have stayed on the Titanic? I mean, everybody that stayed on the Titanic died. It's the worst. <laughs> it's the, the only ever. people that uh, you served. compared. It's, the, it's a cell phone. You, you compared your job to running the Titanic. Yeah. Yeah. And you're mad at fans. I don't care who you are, you can't blame the fans ever. You know, no. you know what it reminds me of, and and and, you know, I, the unfortunate the unfortunate comparison draws in race, and I hate that, and I don't want to have that discussion here. He was a winner though. Charlie Strong was a winner, but he blamed our fans, right? He quoted leaving because of the fans, right? He went to Texas, right, because of the high profile nature of the program and the fan support that he felt like he would get and that he didn't get at Louisville. Yeah. Right. And I just see similarities there and I hate that Charlie won though. I mean, you can't take that away from him. 
I don't even really remember that. Yeah. Remember so that. anyway, that's neither here nor there. Okay. So let's the players' championship. We mentioned it. Yep. Got a couple things on it. I think Scotty Scheffler may never lose again if he puts like he did uh, last week. Scotty's pretty definitely the favorite. Yeah. Uh, except I think Rory's on fire right now. Yeah. Uh, It'd be nice to see Rory. Rory so last sure. week was the Arnold Palmer. PGA Tour is in a really tough spot. Arnold Palmer ratings were down 30% last week as compared to the year prior. 30% wow. percent's a lot. Yeah. Uh, so they got to figure something well, out. I think they were banking They were banking on Tiger being a draw, and he's just not – he's not playing well, enough. And they got to figure well. – the problem is the through. whole live issue right now, in my opinion. I, I agree. Um, so that, I mean, they got to figure that issue. out. But – but Players is answer. an awesome tournament. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Now, March Madness. Brackets haven't came out yet. Conference terms are still happening. Let's both pick a winner right now, though. We'll pick one when the bracket comes out. Uh, gosh, I don't want to do that. UConn. I mean, that's who I would pick. I'll have to go with you. I would love to disagree, but I, I'm not yeah. going to disagree. That's who I'm going with. I, I, uh, I hate to say it, but um, – I mean, despite their stretch of three straight home losses this year, I think Kentucky could make some noise. I think they're either in the Final Four or lose the first weekend. That's bad. That is such a good that, – that, isn't, that, isn't that Cal? If they get past the first weekend, I think they're in the Final isn't Four. Isn't that Cal in a nutshell? Yeah, pretty much. I hate that, but yeah. Uh, I don't really. <laughs> uh, okay. Only thing I have left is the House passes a bill to ban TikTok. So – this is really dubious for me. Um, there's no right side of this issue, right? Well, they're giving TikTok an out, so I'll read this article. The House on Wednesday passed a bill that would lead to a nationwide ban of the popular video app TikTok if its China-based owner doesn't sell its stake. As lawmakers acted on concerns that the company's current ownership structure is a national security threat, the bill passed by a vote of 352 to 65, which is a very big margin. Uh, now goes to Senate, where its prospects are unclear. TikTok. I, it doesn't. It doesn't survive the Senate. Yeah. So basically, I want Byte Dance to sell their shares. Of That's TikTok. not going to happen. I, I think what's telling is the the statements Byte Dance's statements uh, coming out on this. Like they'd essentially rather the stock price go to zero than give up their. You know, um, yeah, but I mean, they're losing 170 million users. Like to me, that says plain and simple. Like China, like they can, they own us. It's basically what it says to me. Well, they they want the surveillance that comes from it. Yeah, and they're willing to destroy some of the greatest, most valuable technology in the world. Um, as a result, uh, as, as an alternative, like they, if they lose their surveillance opportunity, um, because ByteDance has ties to the CCP, right? Yeah. Ownership. It's an oligarchy. And I mean, I'll just, I have TikTok, spend a lot of time on it, Yeah, but I, I like think TikTok. I don't, will not blame anybody if it is banned here. Like, I won't either. Um, and, and, but on the same hand, I understand that our homegrown social networks harvest our data much the same. Oh, and yeah. and so uh, is I, I, I don't agree in a lot of cases with the politics of big business, specifically big tech. And do I trust that they aren't doing bad things with the data they peel off of users. No, I mean, it, so it's, there's no right side of the issue. I think it's dead on arrival in the Senate. Um, the house, I'm surprised to hear, I had not heard, but I'm surprised to hear how overwhelming that majority was that support. Um, it's funny. Have we found an issue that can be bipartisan in this country? Maybe. It's really interesting, but I still think it's dead on arrival in the Senate because the Senate is where big business is done. And um, I, I, I just I don't I don't see it happening. I don't see I don't see them taking I don't see our government taking that stand. Um, geopolitically, it's just not the right. Uh, yeah. and, and we're doing all of this while we have a porous southern border, and you know, in a presidential election year with real economic issues, you know, the specter of a recession. 
you know, one side saying it's a hard landing, one side saying it's a soft landing. We can't decide whether we're dropping rates or not. Like, I mean, there's just bigger fish yeah. to fry right now. Now, the investor in me is thinking, is Meta a good buy right now? Well, you know, I mean, Meta, just, Meta's been juiced yeah, the last six months. So you, you seen think it? Meta would really juice if TikTok's banned? Well, yes, because Instagram is where all the user base goes. Mm-hmm. Um, Meta. The, let, let's let's talk. Can we talk about this for a moment? In the last six months, Meta has gone from three eleven, okay, to five. It's currently sitting at four ninety four. You know, fifty eight percent increase over the past six months. Wow, fifty eight percent. Sounds like Bitcoin. Guess what? Netflix fifty two percent. Uh, and this is why rates are not going to come down. For yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Amazon twenty two percent increase over the past six months. Uh, Bitcoin, 166%. The Dow Jones, 11.5% over six months. I mean, tell, tell me how the Dow is at 39,000 with interest rates. It's more, home mortgage interest rates at 7.5%. I really don't like, I mean, I don't get it. I don't get it. Seems like everybody seems like a Ponzi is dumping scheme. all their money into <laughs> Zillow's up 12%. The New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, is up 11 and a quarter. The NASDAQ is up 15.6. The S&P is up 14.2. This is like the beginning intro to a video of like tomorrow, everything crashing 50%. Oh, <laughs> and gosh. we start it with, you, with this little section of you naming off all those increases. Yeah. And then <laughs> Disney, 31%. I mean, like, you know, uh, Salesforce, 39%. You can tell what I follow, right? GME is down 20. <laughs> Dogecoin is up 179%. I need to talk to Scott. He needs to sell now. Yeah. Um, anyway. I don't know, man. It's too busy working until 3 a.m. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. Um, I did have – I want to tease a topic that we're going to talk about next week, and, and we don't have time to get into it today. I want to talk about um, the the – how common it's become to see reduced buy side commissions offered by real estate agents when listing property. We have seen, you know, um, we have seen a lot of two and a half. It's become more the norm. Um, we've seen even two and less. There's actually some listings offering zero, which if you're not familiar, the Sitzer Burnett trial says that listing agents no longer, and it, MLSs no longer have the, the ability to um, keep listing agents from offering buy-side commissions. Used to be you couldn't put a property on the MLS unless a buy-side commission was offered. That is no longer the case as a result of the Sitzer Burnett trial. So now we are seeing some listings offer 0% commission. Now, I don't know how the listing agents plan to gain traction there. Maybe they're just using it for internet distribution, whatever you. Um, it's a whole different thing if you ask me, is it good for the consumer? But what we've seen, what we believe we are seeing is some real estate professionals taking advantage of the fact that the consumer is ill-advised, when it comes to, or ill-informed when it comes to buy-side commissions, what these trials are actually about, what the DOJ announcement about commissions was weeks I wonder, ago. I wonder what these sub listing agents are charging on their side. Well, that is just like, it. Are they they're charging, charging 5%? They're charging greater than 3%. So, for example, you list a house at 6 I'm using that as an example. I have to be very careful to say that there is no typical commission when it comes to residential real estate. To say otherwise would be a real uh, a violation of antitrust law, but I think it's fair to also say we see a lot of six percent listings. We see a lot of those listings split evenly between the buying and selling agent of three percent and three percent. And in fact, a lot of that is the basis for the discussion about the Sitzer Burnett trial, um, which ruled that, an, among other things. Um, essentially commissions should be decoupled. They should not be negotiated by the listing agent with the seller that the buyer's agent um, should negotiate their own commission with their buyer. What we're seeing is that professionals are listing at six, taking three and a half percent on the list side or even 4% on the list side, offering two and a half or even two on the buy side. And the agent doesn't on the buying side doesn't realize the disparity until the closing table. And those are, 
prompting some very interesting discussions. So my question for any real estate professional out there is, is this a trend that should continue? Um, what should you be thinking about when it comes to these things? And if a company like ours, you know, that has some momentum that uh, is quite productive chooses to do so, is that, is it something we should consider? Yeah. I already have some thoughts and questions so, about this, but we'll, we'll save it for the yeah, next I, I I wanted to tease it. I want you to think about it and I want to prepare our listeners because I think this is a growing conversation that we're going to see in the industry. And a lot of our listeners are real estate agents. So, um, it, it's a topic I think that, that we need to touch. We need to address. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. That's all the time we got for you this week, folks. We appreciate you tuning in. As always, find us on the socials at J Pitts Realtor at Ryan Harris dot R E. I remembered it now. Uh, but yeah, that's it. We're done for this week. We'll see you soon. Hopefully, uh, you enjoyed the episode. I am your host, Jay Pitts, here for Ryan Harris. We'll Peace. see you soon.